Hi, and welcome to our third panel of the day. Um, as Carla mentioned, uh, my name is Christina Warner, and I'm a graduate of the law school, currently serving as the Getches Weiss Fellow in the building at the Getches Wilkinson Center, uh, where I have the pleasure to work with Carla Fredericks and Charles Wilkinson. Uh, so this panel today will explore the important topic of indigenous environmental stewardship, including themes like the challenge of climate change, and adaptation demands on indigenous communities, environmental justice, jurisdictional authority, and the tribal role in building regulatory capacity. So this panel has un undergone a few changes during our planning process, um, and we have two very distinguished panelists with us today. So I'm going to have it so that they both speak, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions before we move into our last panel of the day. Uh, so our first speaker will be Don Wharton who's a senior attorney in NARC's Boulder office. Um, he's a graduate of CU Law and has served as the Assistant Attorney General for Natural Resources and Special Projects during his tenure with Navajo Nation, uh, the Department of Justice there. He was also the founding director of Oregon Legal Services Native American program. He served as a solicitor in the Indian Affairs Division of the Interior Department's Solicitor Office, was special counsel to the American Indian Policy a review commission and was general counsel to the Klamath Indian Tribe of Oregon. Uh, Heather Kendall Miller to my left is our second panelist and she's an attorney at NARF's Anchorage office. She's Denina Athabaskan and received her bachelor's from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and her JD from Harvard Law. She clerked in the Alaska Supreme Court and then with a two-year Skadden fellowship she worked for Alaska Legal Services and NARF in the area of Alaska Native Rights. Uh, since becoming a staff attorney with NARF she's practiced exclusively in the area of tribal rights and subsistence. And so on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Don. Thank you, Christina. I'm gonna get over here where I can uh, get the clicker. Uh, this was sort of a short notice presentation, but uh, I thought it would be worthwhile to sort of uh, talk about climate change itself as a, 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 not that anybody in this audience will need convincing about climate change, but uh, all the same, there are those who think about it. Uh, so the need for adaptation plans, and then we'll talk a little bit later about what adaptation plans are. Okay, so let's have a quick look here that uh, what we have is uh, this graph that shows what the CO2 emissions in uh, gigatons are since 1990. Now, this is not something that's happened, you know, uh, over the long-term uh, history, but this is just since 1990. You can see that the increase in, uh, in gigaton uh, emissions has uh, been uh, fairly dramatic as it rises uh, up through 2014 uh, and, to, and headed towards 2015. So there's uh, the fact that we are having significant increases uh, in CO2 emissions uh, is, of course, not encouraging. Uh, this is about sea level rise, and sea level rise is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is if you happen to live on an island in the ocean, uh, you notice it, uh, and you notice it for, or if you live uh, on the shorelines of the ocean, you notice it uh, for very important reasons. Uh, because in some cases, like in uh, Tuvalu in the, in the South Pacific, uh, you no longer have a home. Uh, you're living on a coral atoll, and uh, you know, your potable water is gone, and you have to find someone else, some place else to live, and literally your nation uh, disappears as a nation. These are the sea level uh, since 1700, and you can see that uh, it's fairly precipitous uh, change over time, particularly as we start looking towards possible futures uh, uh, for now. Uh, the third thing to look at is El Nino, and what you see here is uh, these red lines right here. What happens is, is that the trade winds across uh, the, the, come from the east across the ocean. And about right here is what's known as the Western Pacific Warm Pool. And when the trade winds abate, uh, they slow down. Uh, they no longer keep the dead pool, that, uh, that warm pool in place, and it begins to migrate east. And when it starts migrating east, it starts changing uh, the surface temperature of the ocean. And the surface temperature of the ocean starts changing weather patterns because of the winds uh, reacting to uh, the temperature on the surface of the water. Uh, and so you see here in 1982, uh, where, they, where they're 
this is what El Nino looked like, and you see some warming spots up here as well. Well, in 1997, uh, it sees significant increases in this uh, as, as uh, that was developing in 97. But in 2015, what you see is not just you know, this area that's being affected by the, the, the migration of the warm pool, but you see uh, all across these other areas in the Indian Ocean and the, into the Pacific and other places where you get significant warming. Now, Ocean rise is not just melting of, of ice. Ocean rise is half of ocean rise is temperature. Expansion of the water is a result of temperature. So when you get this sort of warming, you get significant ocean rise as a result of the warming of the water. Uh, and as you can see, that's fairly very significant for all of these places that come along these coastlines. Uh, yeah. For our purposes, you know, they're, they're, those sort of concerns are, are significant. You know, so these are the kind of the, the climate issues. Uh, when the indigenous people, like the uh, EOSIS, the, the small island states, took a position on what sort of emissions would be acceptable, they said that you know, no more than a temperature rise of 1.5 centigrade would be acceptable. Uh, and that was taken primarily from what's called the IPCC, the Intergovernmental panel on climate change, which is an intergovernmental panel of scientists put together to investigate and write about climate. Uh, and so what the government did in response to that was said, well, yeah, we looked at all that and we understand what you're saying. We think two degrees would be fine. Uh, and so uh, when you look at that issue, you see that, uh, that the emissions before this threshold is exceeded would be 275,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide. Uh, well, that's just to get to 1.5 centigrade. Uh, at 2 centigrade, 100,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide would be needed. Uh, well, you can see over here that the cumulative total anthropogenic CO2 emissions since 1870, uh, to get to 1,000, to, to it's not going to take an awful lot more. We're already close to exceeding uh, that level uh, already. Uh, so what we have is significant uh, rise in temperature, and of course the rise in temperature has all the corollary impact effects uh, on, on, the, on the climate. Uh, mostly we looked at the ocean, but of course they have all those effects inland too. Uh, so the question is, given that this is, this is our future, this is what we're going to need to live with and to, and to accommodate, how do we adapt to it? What do we do to try to prepare ourselves for it? Well, EPA's uh, response to that was to say, well, what we need to do is we need to assist ourselves and others in putting together national climate change adaptation plans. And so they began to, they developed their own such plan, uh, and they had the EPA National Environmental Program offices, uh, all of their media offices, air, water, underground injection, they also provided an, uh, their own implementation plans for adaptation. And the regional offices, of which there are 10, uh, in turn wrote all of their implementation plans. Uh, you all have zip drives, I think, that you received. They look like no zip drive I've ever seen before. Uh, on that zip drive, you will see that all of these are available. You know, we've collected all of these adaptation plans for you so you can see what they say uh, and uh, what, uh, what, uh, what they provide for. So what they do is, uh, they're taking action on climate change to improve air quality. They are, oh, did I lose the mic? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, so they're uh, taking action on climate change to improve air quality. They are protecting America's waters. Now, these are the vulnerabilities that EPA has identified. You know, what are the vulnerabilities that are a result of climate change? So uh, air quality, uh, water, uh, cleaning up communities, and advancing sustainable development. You know, so where you have uh, toxic, for example, or uh, like mining waste, things like that, is cleaning up those communities where you've got those sort of issues and advancing sustainable development and ensuring the safety of chemicals and preventing pollution and enforcing environmental laws. That's the vulnerabilities that EPA 
has identified as a part of the matrix for their adaptation plan. Uh, so what are the 10 priority actions then uh, that are identified to address these vulnerabilities? The first is to continue to fulfill the strategic measures in the 2011-2015 EPA strategic plan, which is available on, on the internet uh, under EPA's site. Protect agency facilities and operations. Uh, factor legal considerations into adaptation efforts. Strengthen adap adaptive capacity of EPA staff and partners through training. Develop decision support tools that enable EPA staff and partners to integrate climate adaptation planning into their work. Identify cross EPA science needs related to climate adaptation. And partner with tribes to increase adaptive activity ca capacity and focus on the most vulnerable people and places. And of course, amongst the most vulnerable people and places are tribes and tribal communities. You know, so EPA identifies those as specific action plans that are needed to begin to develop uh, to address the vulnerabilities. Uh, measure and evaluate performance and finally develop program and regional office implementation plans, which they have done uh, and are available to you. So in addition to EPA, uh, doing these adaptation plans, the Interior Department has created uh, what are called climate science centers. And the climate science centers uh, are funded by EPA to do research, uh, uh, to partner with the natural and cultural resource managers to provide science that helps on fish, wildlife, ecosystems, and the communities, and to support, adapt to climate change. So. There is scientific support and research information available through these climate science centers. So very quickly, uh, they're doing cutting edge research projects. That's their view that it's cutting edge, but you know, each person has their own view of that. Uh, so on a national and regional scale, uh, to uh, build upon federal university partnerships. So many of these centers are at universities, if not all of them, actually. Uh, to, and to work with stakeholders, and of course, tribes are among the stakeholders uh, that are, uh, they're, they're tasked with working with, to provide educational opportunities for students and early career scientists through fellowships, workshops, and trainings, and to work specifically with tribes and indigenous communities to better understand the specific vulnerabilities to climate change and to help them adapt to their impacts. So the, these climate science centers are, are an important resource to tribes because they are specifically tasked with the responsibility of working with tribes to do this. So where are they? Uh, in Alaska, they're at, uh, at, this, at uh, the University of Fairbanks. Uh, in uh, this area, they're at the University of Colorado, Colorado State University, rather up in Fort Collins. Uh, in the South Central, they're at the University of Oklahoma in Norman, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, University of Arizona uh, in Tucson, and Oregon State University in Corvallis. You know, so uh, again, you can just go to the, the website, which I think was back there, over there on the, on the edge, uh, is the website where the, the, you can uh, look these folks up and uh, find out you know, where they are and uh, how, can, how they can be of support and use to you. They don't frequently call you up and volunteer for this, so you probably have to contact them. So. All right, so that's what uh, the federal government has been doing on its side through EPA and Interior through these, uh, these science centers. So what have the tribes been doing? Well, uh, I thought we'd be useful to look at just specifically at one tribe that has done an adaptation plan using these resources. Uh, the Salish and Kootenai tribe has put together a climate change strategic plan. And uh, it's worth just reading this, that the tribe's mission is guided by traditional principles and values. Adopt traditional principles and values into a facets of all tribal operations and services. Invest in their people in a manner that ensures their ability to become completely self-sufficient society and economy. And strive to provide sound environmental stewardship that pr preserves, perpetuates, protects, and enhances natural resources and ecosystems. That's their mission. So the strategic plans, mitigation, and adaptation strategies are guided by local impact assessments. And these assessments investigate the vulnerabilities, risks of forestry, land, fish, wildlife, water, air, infrastructure, people, and culture sectors to the impacts of climate change. So again, in, in indigenous people, indigenous culture, 
you know, the environmental impact that affects the culture. You know, and then that's as, as important as any other natural resource uh, to those folks. Vulnerability, as they define it, is the susceptibility of a system to harm from climate change impacts. So harm to the culture, harm to individuals, harm to any resource, they're all evaluated on the same basis. The risk is the consequence of the impact times the probability or likelihood that the impact will happen. Now these assessments determine the urgency of each planning area, ranging from high, low to high priority and guide the development of preparedness goals and actions. So this is all part of what the Salish and Kootenai tribes model is, is their climate change adaptation plan says. All climate change models predict warmer temperatures, lower snowpack, more frequent and severe droughts and floods, expected climate trends, up to five degrees Fahrenheit warmer between 2035 and 2045, up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer 27, 2075 and beyond, lower and extended low stream flow in late summer, earlier and greater spring off run continuing declines in snowpack at the lower elevations, shifts in species range for wildlife and plants, declines in aquatic species such as bull trout and cutthroat trout. So they're identifying these specific anticipated impacts that they will need to accommodate themselves to as they do their adaptation planning. Declines in alpine and subalpine species, including subalpine fir, Engelmann spruce, bighorn sheep, pika, and mountain goat, greater likelihood of severe wildfire, increased spread of invasive plants and animals, more pest and disease outbreaks such as mountain pine beetle. Decline in summer precipitation, increase in the winter precipitation, greater precipitation change at higher elevations. So what they've done is they've gone out and they've looked, they've taken the, into account the, the, an assessment of what this is, and these are the impacts that they anticipate. So the land and the water, says one uh, indigenous leader, were given to us by our ancestors to manage so that we could pass it on to our children and future generations. It is our common responsibility and moral obligation for our children. This again is, a, is, a, is an understanding that these resources are not ours. We are the trust holders of these resources for the future generations. These are the words of, of, the, of the minister from Tokelau. Tokelau, again, is a South Pacific island that is uh, already uh, suffering significant impacts from, from uh, sea level rise. Uh, they no longer have uh, the ability to keep their potable water uh, as they had before. They now have uh, cisterns and just to have, be able to keep their water. So uh, this is the charge uh, from the indigenous people as our responsibility as we begin to think about how to do these adaptation plans to plan for literally survival in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I too had to uh, prepare rather last minute. I was doing jury duty all last week and showing up at 8.30 and being released at 1. So um, it was a little bit iffy if I was going to be able to make it. Luckily, I um, was not chosen, uh, which was a good thing because the two young black men that were being prosecuted uh, we're certainly probably going to be convicted by a jury not of their peers. And I want to say, give a shout out to my wonderful colleagues that came all this way from Alaska to be here. Um, we've worked with, with many tribes in the interior. Um, it's, it's wonderful to, to have you here. I want this audience to know, however, that uh, part of their hearts are still back home because there is a trial going on there involving what is known as the Alaska Four, four young Athabascan men that were prosecuted for a heinous crime, murder, which they did not commit, and uh, they are currently going through a, uh, another uh, jury after 17, 18 years of it being in jail. So um, thank you for choosing to come here. Um, to be present. That's a big one for NARP, John, that uh, 
we've got such support from our Alaska family tribes. I am Heather Kendall Miller. I have been a NAF, NARF staff attorney since 1993. It's the only job I've ever held as an attorney, and it will be the last job I hold as an attorney before I choose to retire. It has given me a wonderful professional career to represent tribes in helping support their aspirations towards self-determination and protecting their hunting and fishing rights. Today I'm going to talk a little bit, well, I'll talk my entire time here, about a project that I've been engaged in for the past three or four years. I think it provides a very good um, case analysis of uh, an example of what tribes in Alaska are doing to protect their lands and natural resources against environmental degradation that is so common in Alaska and elsewhere and has uh, the potential impact of adversely in, uh, impacting their lands, their fish, their waters, their culture, their way of life. You guys all know what that, that is. Um, I was contacted about three years ago by a small federally recognized tribe called the Native Village of Tionic, which resides on the east side of the Cook Inlet. And they came to us and asked if we could assist them in helping them push back against a coal development that had been um, initiated by a developer who want, wanted to be able to get permits to dredge down into uh, the middle of the last uh, salmon habitat rivers on that side of the Cook Inlet. The company uh, is seeking a permit that would allow it to drill into the river 350 feet down and uh, draw down from the groundwater and then set it aside and then attempt to put everything back together again as it's leaving. Well, this happens to be right in the backyard of this tribe, 12 miles away. And the tribe had been attempting to effectively um, it, get input into the process that had begun, the NEPA process, but found that it was uh, up against too many big obstacles. They effectively needed the assistance of an attorney. Now, our NARF office is a small office, and we haven't typically done this kind of work. We've litigated, uh, spent a lot of time in courts, federal and state courts, litigating. But when clients come to you and tell you that they've got a problem and they need your help, then you have to sit back and think, well, this is about preserving a way of life. This is about protecting lands and land resources. This is about elevating the voice of a tribal government in a way that to make sure that their concerns are heard. So we agreed to come in on their behalf and get engaged in this. And the first thing we did was we sought to have the tribe become a cooperating agency in the NEPA process that had already been in place for four to five years. Um, in Alaska, most of you probably know, tribes have been disenfranchised franchise from their land. Uh, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act that was passed in 1971 gave land to corporations and uh, left the tribes with, without a land base. So although we have tribes that are federally recognized as sovereigns, they lack jurisdiction over lands. So the status of tribes, because they're still governments, they still had the right to request and to be granted cooperating agency status. Why is this important? Because it allows them to work from the internal side while the other federal agencies and the state are working through the NEPA process itself. Um, again, NEPA requires that federal agencies uh, look at um, a, a, anything, any undertaking that's gonna affect waters of the United States and then require the developer, whoever submitted the permit, to show that they can remediate or avoid uh, adverse impacts. Um, so once a tribe came in to the, as a cooperating agency, they requested all the information that had been developed to date. And that included quite a bit of information that 
the developer's contractor had begun. And one of the obligations of a developer is to identify cultural resources that may be adversely impacted. And then those resources uh, will be, after identified, it will create an obligation on the agency to develop a programmatic agreement with tribes to discuss and negotiate how best to protect these resources. Well, it turned out that the work that had been done by the contractors um, specialist, they had done a good job of surveying the land in and around where Tionic Head uh, has lived and uh, used and occupied the land. And they had identified a many, many, many archeological sites that happened to be there. The reason why is because the Tionic people, they call themselves Tabunga people, beach people, have resided on the same area for the past thousand years at a minimum. This whole entire area of Cook Inlet has numerous um, archeological sites from house pits, cache sites, uh, you name it. And although the contractor had identified these things, they just noted them, they didn't find them to be particularly significant. They had identified, however, however a former homestead that had been run by a non-native family and it had, uh, uh, it was very much left in place and then they used that as a basis for examining the non-native occupation of this area from like the 1930s. And on that basis had recommended that a district be nominated under the uh, National Historic Preservation Act as a historic district. Um, what that does is once found eligible, it essentially heightens the standards by which the agencies have to look at a property and the impacts that will occur to that property. Well, when we looked at that, we realized right away, wait a minute, some, there's a lot missing here. This area has only been evaluated for its significance from this perspective of a non-native approach that starts at a time of occupation. It does not take into consideration the fact that the Denai people themselves have lived and occupied in this area for the past thousand years. And once that was um, done, then our uh, uh, wonderful experts, anthropologists, help us understand that the area should have been identified under what's called criteria A. Now, the National Historic uh, Preservation has four criteria primarily which to which they look at for purposes of determining whether or not a place is, is historically significant. And the, the uh, land, the uh, area, the archeological district that had been found eligible, had been found eligible under criteria D. And that criteria looks to whether or not the specific area has yielded or is likely to yield information important to history or prehistory. Again, that was from the non-native side. There's another criteria, however, and that criteria is criteria A. And that criteria looks to whether or not a property is eligible if it is associated with events and, ha and whether it's made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. Well, we said this should have been analyzed under criteria A because clearly this area has been uh, significant to the Dena'ina people themselves going back a thousand years. So we started that process of trying to get the attention of the State Historic Preservation um, Office, uh, the uh, Advisory Council for Historic Properties in DC, the Keeper, everybody. And eventually we were able to get the property, um, the archeological district considered as eligible for under criteria A as well as D. But in the process of doing that, the keeper let us know that they thought that not only was this small archeological district eligible under both criteria A and D, but that it was part of a much broader landscape that should be considered as well under criteria A. 
and they were in fact right. And that led us to the work of Tom King who, and Pat Parker. Um, for you students who are not yet familiar in cultural resources, eventually you will discover these two uh, luminaries because they contributed greatly to our understanding. What those two individuals had done over time, Pat Parker worked for the Park Service and Tom as well had worked for uh, many of the federal agencies and they, over the course of the past 20 years, had essentially beaten down the doors at the Park Service and the National Historic Preservation um, Council to say, we have to find a better way of looking at properties that are significant to Native Americans and, and shift the paradigm, essentially, from one that just views properties as being uh, important or significant from the perspective of you know, an old building that was important during the Civil War or this or that. From a Native American perspective, the values that are placed on lands are much more holistic. They include elements of, uh, of uh, characteristics that are sometimes intangible because Native American communities have a much longer relationship to the land and one that is frequently based very much on spiritual a spiritual relationship. So how do you capture those kinds of values? Well, the Park Service and the Advisory Council has been struggling with this and had done a number of bulletins over the years that tried to capture those kinds of values to give guidance to others as to um, how to assess properties that are significant to Native Americans. And one of the things that has uh, come to be in the most recent years is the whole concept of a traditional cultural landscape. A traditional cultural landscape is actually an area um, viewed from a native perspective that is part of uh, their indigenous use and occupancy areas and contemplates the uh, TLC um, contemplates the relationship of the people to the land and takes into consideration all of these other elements, uh, the, the, the spiritual elements, the, the, um, the use and occupancy of the resources there, the reliance upon the fish. Um, it's a much more holistic view. And so we got to work and worked with the tribe and put together a, a nomination for eligibility of a traditional cultural landscape. That's what's in your material. Um, I did not have time to do um, points, but this is, this, the entirety of this is in your material so that people can look and see what such a uh, nomination looks like. And this is very comprehensive and it's currently um, being considered by the advisory council. Now, why is this important in the context of what the tribe is doing with respect to NEPA. By being able to uh, identify this broader landscape as being culturally significant and important and having it identified as such on the National Register of Historic Preservation, it provides a more holistic approach when evaluating adverse impacts. Now, the Corps of Engineers, unfortunately, is the lead agency undertaking uh, this NEPA uh, development of the uh, environmental impact statement and uh, is, is not quite keen on wanting to have to deal with the traditional cultural landscape. But nonetheless, it is coming. And what we anticipate is that it will broaden the area of impact that they have to take into consideration beyond just the footprint of the mine itself into the whole adjoining area that has been subject to the tribe's use and occupancy for many, many years. Uh, this has been a moment, I mean, a very, very uh, difficult uh, to get this far because the tribe has been um, treated as if their interests are not important here. One of the first things that the tribal council 
uh, talked with us about when we first visited with them is their concern that this activity was going to disturb numerous grave sites in this area. You think a thousand years of occupation, at least a thousand years of occupation, there are definitely grains, grave sites in the area and many of them. In this report, I've included, and I had to think about whether I should do so or not, but uh, did uh, part of what we have had to do is to expend tribal resources to essentially document what the Corps and the developer should have been doing itself all along. And that is when the tribe said, we are concerned that this is going to um, affect grave sites and all these other cultural resources. The Corps wouldn't listen, wouldn't pay any attention. We had some anthropologists go out and look at the middens in some of these areas to identify the extent to which the middens contained um, subsistence resources. And in doing so, they inadvertently discovered a cremation site that goes back to the 1800s. And this body was of a young Athabascan woman, probably between 18 and 23. Uh, she was cremated in the traditional uh, fashion. And it was right out in the middens, right beyond one of these major house sites that had been identified. A clear example of how the tribe knew what it was talking about when they were telling the Corps, we have concerns here and our concerns needed, need to be addressed. Um, in any event, it's, it's part of an ongoing odyssey, uh, working through these processes, but it um, has been an extremely um, challenging and at the same time rewarding in the sense that our work together with the tribe has been so enriching to come to know and understand the tribe's history, like the Tabanga people, Tionic, and understand their relationship to the land that has been ongoing for so long, and to assist them in empowering their voice to be able to make a difference and have this Western model that we've got for mining and such push back uh, to include and address the perspective from the Native American view. That's the snapshot of the Tionic uh, to begin. Environmental stewardship and the importance of including the indigenous perspective, especially when engaging with federal and state actors. Um, we do have a few minutes, so if there are any questions, uh, we have a little bit of time for that. Like people want to break. Going back. Yeah, I and. Actually, if I had had time to do slides or whatever, I should have broken that down a little bit better. Um, the National Historic Preservation uh, Law, when it was enacted, has within it what's called Section 106 that obligates, again, uh, a developer to identify cultural resources that must be avoided or protected or mitigated. Um, and that requires, it, it, it overlaps with the NEPA process in a way that requires whoever the, uh, the um, lead agency is to include within the development of the EIS this what's called the 106 process. They have to integrate it into their NEPA process and be able to show that, first of all, identify the resources and show that there is a plan in place that they fulfill by developing a programmatic agreement. So it's the 106 and the NEPA process, which is the um, you know, 402 permit process that typically the federal agencies engaged in that overlap. Now, it's the lead agency that has direct responsibility 
and they may or may not defer to their other federal partners. We've gotten every other federal agency to engage with the tribe on a government-to-government -government basis, consultation, sharing information, and they all have been great to work with, but the Corps. Uh, but because the Corps got the lead agency uh, involvement, so we in a position where we have to see when they're going to get to the 106 issues that we are particularly interested in. Does that help? Thanks. All right, we'll take uh, one more, I think. When you were talking about making that climate change plan for the one tribal group, uh, you sort of mentioned some of the things you're going to have to adapt to. Uh, have they since, or have y'all continued to work on some of those adaptations? And are there any concrete steps they've taken to adapt to, like, the lower <laughs> trout populations, for example? Uh, adaptation plans, by their very nature, are, are evolutionary documents. They're not, they're not static. And so it's literally a plan. Uh, so yes, the tribe, uh, Salish and Kootenai is a particularly progressive tribe in, in ca its capabilities and what it does, and it, and, and it continues to work on, on all of these issues as it, as it, well, as the information continues to come in. You know, this is an evolving issue as well, you know, because climate change is by definition something that's changing. And so they're taking as much information as they have now to try to, to deal with the things that are in front of them. But those things will, over the decades, change, and so will the plans. So yes, they are working on those things. Is that what you're looking for? Uh, it, 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 is. it is enough. I understand like the evolutionary nature of it, but I was just curious if like if I was just curious what some of the subs they maybe have already tried, like what maybe some of the things they've tried, and maybe things have worked out, and like you said, maybe things change. Of course, but no, I okay. don't. I'm sorry, I don't have that. Okay. Okay, and we do have one last question. Hi, Heather. Um, a question about cooperating agency status for uh, tribes or native villages. Um, do you, can you talk uh, for a minute about the advantages and disadvantages of that status? And, um, you know, if a tribe or a village is a cooperating agency, uh, plays that role, and then they don't like the final decision by the lead agency about granting a permit or whatever, um, you know, the, the possible downsides associated with being a CA status? The advantages of being a CA is that the tribe is able to help develop or direct the Corps' attention to their responsibilities of how to develop the record. And in this case, for instance, the Corps has obligations not under just 106, but environmental justice and health related things, issues that the tribe in particular has expertise in or concerns about that were off the radar screen as far as the Corps was concerned. They were not focusing on these issues in terms of spinning out or developing their uh, internal. Now, at this stage as a cooperating agency, only the agencies have the ability to be able to review material that's being offered by the developer and give comment back in, to identify areas, gaps, holes, and such, and to suggest that the core should require additional work to be done to fulfill these various obligations. That has been the challenge, is getting the core focused on what it should be doing instead of what it is doing. Does that hurt? the tribe's ability after the fact to come back and sue. No, it doesn't. Because what it does do is it gives us the advantage of knowing where the holes and gaps are and where the legal uh, uh, problems exist with the record when it does become final. So. All right, so thank you again to our two panelists. We'll be shifting to the fourth panel right now, but I do want to mention that there is some afternoon coffee next door if anyone needs to pick me up.